Um, I think science, technology started in the West. There was something about Western civilization that en enabled them to happen. We can have debates as to exactly uh, what parts of the Western tradition uh, uh, really opened uh, it up to, to scientific and technological innovation. But I, I, I think it has something to do with the freedom of individuals to think for themselves and, um, and, um, and a way in which the, so, um, the, uh, the, the social conformity was not uh, quite so overwhelming. And, and I, I worry that we are, um, we are not uh, actually living in as much of a scientific and technological age as, uh, as is often advertised. Uh, if you, um, and you, know, you, can, you can look at this from the perspective of Washington, D.C. You can look at this from the perspective of Hollywood. Um, cert certainly, uh, in, in, in the world of Washington, D.C., there are 535 congressmen and senators. I, I once did a study on this. By a generous count, maybe 35 of them had a background in science, engineering, or technology. The rest of them do not know that windmills do not work when the wind is not blowing or that solar panels do not work at night. Um, and you're basically stuck in the Middle Ages in, 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 one, in one way or, or another. And, um, and, then, uh, and then from the perspective of, of Hollywood, um, uh, when we sort of think about what does the technological future look like, um, we are told it will be just catastrophic and dystopian in every way imaginable, and that uh, technology will destroy the world. And you can choose a future that looks um, at some combination of a Terminator movie or The Matrix or Avatar or Elysium. I watched the uh, Gravity movie about a year ago, and it was, um, it was sort of this, it's a sort of this uh, disaster in outer space. And, and you watch the movie, you would never want to go into outer space. You would be very happy to be back on some muddy tropical island. And, um, and, and you know, I, I don't think it's, I'm not even you know, blaming Hollywood or DC altogether. I think uh, they, they both, in, um, in many ways, more reflect our society than they created. They do both, they both reflect and create it, but I think it's often more a reflection of this, uh, of this, um, of this sort of technological inertia in one way or another. Um, I think there's been, if we sort of look at the last um, a few decades, uh, 40, 50, you know, since the 70s, I, I think there has been, there has been enormous progress in uh, the world of computers, um, internet, mobile internet, um, the world of information technology, but there are many other areas where I think uh, things have uh, stalled rather badly, uh, if, we were, if we were to be honest about it. So, uh, and I think every, everything in the world of atoms, rather than bits, has seen much less progress. And so, uh, so things that, and, and we don't even consider these to be technologies anymore, but the, the categories people would have talked about in the 1950s and 1960s, nuclear power, electricity too cheap to meter, uh, in Eisenhower's Adams for Peace speech, 1954, um, that sort of uh, is, is off the agenda. Uh, supersonic travel, space uh, travel, underwater cities, uh, turning deserts into farmland or forests, uh, um, the green revolution and in food innovation, um, all these sorts of things have sort of uh, petered out in various ways. Uh, the, um, and as, as, we've, as, as um, biotechnology, medical technology, still progressing, but probably at a somewhat diminished rate. And, uh, and as these areas have failed, uh, they sort of, there's a certain hysteresis that kicks in where failure begets failure. And so when Nixon declared war on cancer in 1970 and promised we would defeat it by the bicentennial by 1976, 44 years later, um, maybe we're 44 years closer to the goal by definition, but there's a sense we're more than six years away. Um, um, it would be inconceivable to declare war on Alzheimer's or dementia, even if you know one out of three people at age 85 suffer from it. Uh, and so there is sort of um, much less of a of an impetus for uh, for these kinds of things in in the society uh, we we now live in. Um, people often ask, you know, why this is, why why has this why has this happened? I always am nervous about answering questions that start with why, but I'll give, um, let me give both a libertarian and a, a, a conservative answer. You know, I think the, the libertarian answer is that we've basically outlawed everything in the world of atoms. We've left the world of bits relatively unregulated. It costs $100,000 to start a computer software company. It costs you a billion dollars to get a new drug approved through the FDA, and therefore um, it's not surprising that we live in a world where people start more um, video game companies and uh, they don't actually work on uh, drugs that would uh, save people's lives. Um, and so I think there is sort of this, uh, this, uh, th there's sort of this, um, there's sort of this, uh, this extraordinary uh, um, regulatory double standard. Um, and then I think, um, and then I think from a, uh, I think from a, um, from a more uh, conservative perspective, 
there is um, there is sort of the sense that we've um, we've you know we've become a more risk averse society. We 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 don't um, we we uh, we've lost we've lost uh, we've lost uh, hope for the future in all these all these different ways. And uh, and I think this um, and I think this has sort of seeped in in all these uh, subtle different ways. You know, it's 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 a uh, it's uh, we we. There's there's a libertarian or conservative bias that the government can't do things, but uh, but I don't think this is absolutely true. You know, the government did succeed in um, the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. Um, it did succeed in Apollo. There was the SDI effort in the 80s, which I think would have actually succeeded had it been continued. You know, we would actually have lasers that could shoot down ICBMs today had we actually kept working on it, and um, and. Uh, and uh, we're now at a point where you can't even get a website for uh, for for Obamacare, and um, and I, I think that um, and you know um, whatever whatever you you know whatever you think of the morality of nuclear weapons, I, I want to suggest that uh, that uh, that building an atomic bomb is a far harder uh, undertaking than building you know building a uh, building an internet website, and so um, and so we should not let our ideological biases um, obscure. The sort of objective decline that has happened, and I think, I think the universities have played a, a big role in this decline. Where, where, um, where uh, you know, one of the ways that science happens is that it requires people to be um, somewhat idiosyncratic, eccentric thinkers of one sort or another. And uh, I think we've had sort of this Gresham's law at work, uh, sort of where the bad currency drives out the good. And the, um, the, the, the real scientists have been replaced by people who are nimble in the art of writing government grants um, and sort of these politicians disguised as scientists who are good at, uh, at collecting money from the government. I think it's like this problem that already exists in the time of Plato, you know, can the philosopher be a king? And philosopher is interested in the truth, the king is interested in power. And I think uh, the, the sort of modern analog to that is can a, a scientist be a good politician? And I think the answer is almost always no, because a scientist is interested in truth, and a politician is interested in getting money and lying about the truth. And, uh, and these two things are, are quite at odds. And so as science has become uh, politicized, and as you have sort of these grant writing uh, processes where you, um, you sort of apply for grants, uh, and you'll get a grant if everyone thinks your experiment will succeed, you end up only doing experiments that everyone thinks will work. The experiments always they mostly work, um, but uh, but uh, you never really push the envelope. You never really ask tough questions, and uh, and so I think you know it's always easiest for us to see a lot of the conformity and political correctness in the humanities. The sciences are always sort of hard and esoteric, and so you know who's really to say that there's no progress in you know quantum computing or in string theory that that's all just sort of a fraud, or that you know all these other areas, genomics, all these other areas are kind of um, way overhyped, and it's, it's very hard because the uh, progress in all these areas is evaluated in, by this peer review methodology where people sort of, um, sort of uh, tell one another that all is well and everything is fantastic, and the public at large um, is told that it's too stupid to possibly understand what is going on. There are occasionally are some chinks in the armor. There's this very you know, disturbing set of studies where about half the articles uh, printed in Science and Nature magazines, the two leading uh, publications involve experiments that cannot be repeated by anybody, um, um, and I do think, uh, and I do think there's sort of an ideological version where there's certain certain areas of science that are just taboo. And so, if you're questioning Darwinism or if you're questioning uh, uh, climate change, uh, you always get in trouble. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and so there are all these areas that uh, where there's conformity. Um, one of my um, uh, one of uh, one of the people I know at Stanford uh, was a um, guy, Bob Laughlin, who uh, is a professor in physics. He got a Nobel uh, Prize in physics uh, in the late 90s. And after he received his Nobel Prize, he suffered from the supreme delusion that he now had perfect academic freedom and he could look into any subject matter whatsoever. And this, uh, this turned out to be a very, very big mistake. And uh, he decided to look into something far more controversial than questioning climate change or questioning Darwinism or you know, any, of, any sort of uh, uh, conventionally taboo topics. And he decided to look into the question of how many scientists, or so-called scientists, were fraudulently ripping the government off. <laughs> um, and, um, 
And uh, needless to say, this was a movie that did not end well for, for, for him. Um, one, of my, one of my good friends, I sort of got the story from one of my good friends who uh, was a PhD student of Laughlin's at the time, and he'd come into their office once a week, and it would be, you know, of course he was like a somewhat stubborn, somewhat eccentric person who would tell his, his uh, grad students, you know, I'm so proud of you, you're on the front lines of science, and we're battling all the frauds and imposters, and we're, like, we're at war with the whole world to defend science from, uh, from all these fraudulent people who are stealing money from the government. Um, they sort of had a public hearing where they uh, denounced some of the offending scientists. Um, uh, it sort of all went rather haywire. He was, he was quite promptly defunded by the peer review process. His, his grad students could no longer get PhDs because you can only get a PhD if you get some committee to approve of it. And, um, and that's, that's sort of, that is sort of what happens. And so I think this, uh, you know, I, I do think this problem of political correctness is this, this very, very broad problem that has, you know, that has many, uh, that has many different facets to it and that we, we need to uh, think through uh, really, really hard. Um, there is, you know, there's always a question, um, so the question is how, you know, how we, how we got here. There are questions, um, you know, how one, how one can sort of get out of this zone. Um, I think the, I think the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the core framework I want to leave you with, and then maybe just open up some, some questions, is that uh, I think the, you know, I think we are, we are in a world where, you know, a letter from an Einstein would get lost in the White House mail room. There are all these things you could no longer, you could no longer do. Uh, you know, we, we, and I think, you know, the, the history about the stagnation, sclerosis of, of the United States, the conservative versus liberal debate is always when did this start? And, um, and I think the, you know, the liberals always say it started in the 80s with Reagan. The conservatives say it started in the 70s. And I think the conservatives are really right about that. And this is, this is why I think the 1970s were somehow an incredibly uh, pivotal decade in the history of this country. And we should never, um, we, we always have to insist on, on going back to the history of the 70s as a, as a key point of uh, departure of thinking through what, uh, what has gone uh, wrong or why, why things have sort of flattened out, not just in science and technology, but in so many other fields. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we landed on the moon in July of 1969. Uh, Woodstock started uh, three weeks later. And I think with, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, we can say that that's when the hippies took over the country and when um, the true sort of cultural war over this question of progress was somehow, was somehow lost and the stagnation of the 70s uh, the 70s really set in. And I think that, uh, you know, if we are going to find a way back to the future, I think the first step, um, the first step um, is to realize that we've been wandering in a, in a desert for the last 40 years, uh, and the first step to get out of the desert is to realize that we're in a desert and not in some sort of enchanted forest. Thank you very much.